it's, um, it's really exciting to see what God is doing through so many of our young leaders here at Catalyst and uh, growing their relationship with the Lord, giving them places of leadership and empowerment here within the church. And so uh, we're super grateful for, um, yeah, for all of them. So um, I'm going to pray in just a moment as we dive in. We're going to be hitting several different places. We're going to be in Genesis 2. We're going to be in Philippians 4. 1 Timothy 6 this morning. Um, so if you have your Bibles, just get them ready. It's going to be a little bit maybe like a, we'll do a sword drill a few times in there where you're like, let's see how fast you can get to that spot in the Bible. And if you're new to church, you're like, I don't even know what's in the Bible. That's fine. You can cheat off someone next to you, or we'll have all the passages on the screen uh, for you as well. So will you pray with me? Let's get our hearts and minds ready for what the Lord wants to say to us through his word this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your constant work in our lives. You have never left us, and you have never forsaken us. You have never Never taken your eyes off of us, and you um, have been a perfect father to every single one of us. And we're grateful for who you are, and we're also grateful for what you're doing in us, what you're doing in our lives, what you're doing in our church, what you're doing in the broader community around us. Lord, we see your hand um, all over the place. And if we're in a season right now of our lives where it's hard to see you, or it's hard to hear you, or we're feeling far from you, I just pray that um, during the remainder of this time this morning that uh, we would each have a very real encounter with you. So Holy Spirit, will you speak to our hearts and will you speak to our minds, um, maybe in a way that we haven't heard in a while? Um, and as we just kind of look at this issue of what it means to be discontent, uh, Lord, will you reinstill in each one of us a sense of contentment um, that we would be fully satisfied in you? Lord, we love you, and we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the church said, amen. amen. Hey, we are in part two of our series called Analog Faith. Uh, we're dealing with this issue of discipleship in the digital age, and Phil Graff did a phenomenal job last week of introducing uh, this series to us, and he talked about um, this issue of what it means for us to seek solitude and silence in a world that is full of distractions. And this week, um, we're going to talk a little bit about what some of the digital changes in our society have done for us in our area of contentment and what that's done um, to create this, this ongoing sense of discontent within us. Because we want to just kind of first off recognize, and maybe we should have done this last week when Phil was here, just all of the changes that have happened really in the last 15 years in the digital world that we live in. I mean, think about music. I mean, how many of us have gone to a record store or to go to a store to buy a CD? Remember how large those places used to be? You go to the warehouse, where? The warehouse, right? Like, or, you know, or you would go to Target or another big box store and they just have like rows of DVDs and blue, or not even Blu-rays, you know, and CDs. They were just full of those places, but we don't need that anymore, right? Because we have digital music now and it's completely changed the way we listen to, the way we select music and the way we buy music. Think about movies as well. I mean, how many of you remember, you know, like the old VHS days? Like, I, rem I literally remember, I, this is going to age me a little bit, and some of you are like, ah, we had black and white TV when I was a kid, you know? We, the thought of recording something was like, sorry, is that what you sound like? I apologize for that, but... But like, you know, I, I remember like we didn't even have a VHS player. We had to rent the VHS player from the video store in order to do that. Which, side note, the movie Goonies is like the reason why Goonies is so popular is because of VHS rentals and VHS player rentals. It was like the only VHS tape that they could rent out when you rented those. And so that's how Goonies became so popular. It wasn't that popular when movies came out. Anyway, um, but you remember those days when you had to like go somewhere. You go to Blockbuster. I think there's one Blockbuster left in the world. It's in Alaska. Is that correct? And I, but seriously, there's only one Blockbuster video left in the world today. Think about the way it's changed the way you do events and flights. You don't get you, well, unless you're old, you don't take a paper ticket to the airport anymore, do you? It's on your phone. I, rem I remember when I was in high school, uh, and this was in the early 90s, like I waited outside of, a where of the warehouse for Garth Brooks tickets to buy for my girlfriend for her birthday. Like we literally camped out outside of a blockbuster or a uh, warehouse so that I could get in the Ticketmaster line in order to buy concert tickets. We don't do that kind of stuff anymore, do we? We literally, on that moment, can go on our app and we can buy the tickets however we want. We don't need those types of services anymore. Think about how much has changed photography and video. I mean, it's so obvious how much the digital world has changed that. 
you know, Kodak made the horrible mistake of devaluing digital media when it started to make its emergence. They, want, they felt like the future was still film. And so they decided not to get into the digital media circus and look what happened to Kodak. Or the way that we process information in the digital age is completely different as well. I mean, how many of you still have newspaper subscriptions? Don't raise your hand. You're gonna, you're gonna age yourself, right? I mean, right, we don't get our news there anymore. We don't get our sports updates there anymore. I mean, it really did kill the print media world. When, what did we do before like Google Maps or Apple Maps? How did we get anywhere? Did any of you guys remember that? The Thomas Guide, right? You have that, I, and I was the navigator with my father when we'd take vacation. I had the big folding, you know, like thing in the car. It would, it would go underneath the passenger seat. So whenever we go somewhere, like, all right, whoop, whoop. You know, we're going to Vegas, right? Like, how do we get there, you know? But that's how we did. Nowadays, it's just like, boop, boop, GPS on our phones. And we're, we, we don't, like, we become so dumb with directions. We don't even know which way to go without it. Social media has just changed so much of the way we do uh, with the way we do life, the way we stay connected with people. I can recall when we were when we were with our launch team in 2007 for Catalyst Church in our living room. We had a college student on our launch team that said, "Hey, Chris, can I start a Facebook page for our church because it's just now opening up to the general public?" Like at that time, it was still it was just now going to where anyone with any email address could get a Facebook account. Prior to that, it was only college students, and so she thought this would be a good way to attract young people to our new emerging church was by creating a Facebook account. I'm like, I have a MySpace account. Is that doesn't that doesn't that say same thing, (laughs) you know? But nevertheless, it's changed so much of uh, the the way that we connect in the world and uh, the global awareness of you know things that we would never be aware of, the information that we would never have been privy to is at our fingertips. In fact, it's it's information overload in so many ways. We're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, in this series. But it's also changed the way we do marketing. I mean, the digital world has changed the way we're marketed too. And now marketing is not just mass marketing, but it's also specified marketing based upon what you're doing on your computer, right? The algorithms are, are watching. They're listening too. Have you ever had that happen? Dude, you're like, I have never said like Mountain Dew Red Blast in my life. And all of a sudden I said it and there it shows up in my Instagram feed. I'm like, dude, Zuckerberg's listening, right? He knows everything right? Bezos hears because he says, oh, I need a new pair of shoes. And then boop, you might also like, and I'm like, what? How did you know that? Right? But social media has changed the way we're market or the digital world has changed the way we're marketed to. I mean, think about um, the way we do ministry nowadays in the church. I mean, we're using our app for all of our registration stuff. We, um, I think about how grateful we were during the pandemic of the digital world that we lived in. I mean, I think if, if the pandemic would have happened in the 90s, your staff here at this church would have literally been delivering tapes and VHS tapes to your home so that you could like keep up with what was going on. Like we'd be, we'd be like mailing like content to you through snail mail to your house. But because of digital, the digital world we live in, it was like, dude, we can live stream stuff. We can create things digitally and just put it online with the snap of a finger, you know, depending on your upload speed. But you, you had the ability to do all that. And so thank God for digital, the digital world we lived in. It, it kept us afloat in so many ways of ministry, especially during times of crisis. But we all know for all of its greatness, the digital world has also created some problems for us, hasn't it? Yes? Yes. I mean, even from a, from a non-religious perspective, the research is undeniable about, the, how the, about what the digital world has done to the, to the average psyche. You know, despite being more globally connected and informed than ever before, we live in a culture now that is more distracted, which is what we talked about last week, we're more foolish. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. That just because, and just because we have information doesn't make us wise. In fact, the mass information has actually made us as a culture more foolish than ever before. But we're more foolish. We're more sad than any other generation before us. In fact, most Americans live in what we would call an echo chamber of information and news. To where now we're just getting what, we, what they think we want to hear or what we want to hear. We, so we live in this echo chamber of agendas and ideas and news sources and talking points. It's making us more foolish. This generation is known to be more depressed, more exposed to terrible things. In fact, the average age of when a person is exposed to pornography in America is 11 years old now. 
we are far more aware and more educated beyond our maturity. In fact, uh, an old friend, Jay Kim, has written a couple books on this, and he says that all this has created what he called, so he, what he called a self-centric despair. And it's a pandemic. The question that I think we have to answer as a church and as the people of God is, what effect is that having on our walks with Jesus? Is it helping us become more like Jesus? Now, for some of us, that you may say, yeah, like 100% yes, like it actually is. Or is it, making a, is it making us into something else? Is it strengthening our faith in God? Or is it weakening it? I'm not sure what the answer is for all of you, um, but we can observe. We can observe, even from a non-religious perspective. And I know this is true just in my life as well, is that I'm actually, I'm more distracted. I'm more discontent. I'm more outraged. In fact, I'm more foolish in some ways than I was. And this is not good for some of us in the pursuit of our godliness and what we want to be with our lives. So we titled this series Analog Faith because we're saying not that we're rejecting digital, but I think there are some aspects of following Jesus in which maybe it's time for us to say, hey, is the digital world we live in making us more like him, or do we need to be a little bit more analog in the way that we interact with God and with other people? Last Sunday I said Phil talked about how we're more distracted, and so the solution, the analog side of distraction is solitude. It's just to be, have that time alone with the Lord, to just be quiet and stop listening to all the other voices around us, just to quiet our minds and our hearts and our souls, and to just listen for the voice of God a little bit more actively with our time. And this morning, we're going to talk about this issue of discontent or discontentment, and how do we find contentment? Because I did a little experiment this week on how I'm being marketed to and what's creating discontent in my life. So I, I was like, I'm just going to do a little experiment here on my own Instagram account. So I'm going to open up my Instagram, and I'm just going to like log the types of images that I'm seeing in my Instagram feed. Okay? So back in the day, Facebook and Instagram, you used to just get basic updates as to the people that you followed or your friends on those social media platforms, right? So you'd see them almost in like a chronological order, and it was just purely like, oh, this is what Cody's doing, and this is what so-and-so's doing, this is what so-and-so's like, and I would just get those. But now, when I went through, I would be like, okay, this is what Summer's doing. Oh, that's kind of cool. I get an update on her family, and this is what Cody's doing. Oh, he's riding his bike in Lompoc today or whatever, and then boop, ad. Right? For something I was like, shoes, car, booze, whatever, you know, whatever it was. Like I'd get an ad, and then it would be like, oh, okay, this is what Tako's doing, you know, this is what so and so's doing. And then it was like, you might also be interested, like this, like an interest video. It was a video of like something that, that because of the things that I've been watching online or on Instagram, it's like, oh, you want to see, you know, people rollerblading and falling or something like that, right? Like, <laughs> like, and it was like 25% of, all that, and that was a pattern. It was two, two, one, two, two, one. They alternated that way. And so it was about every 25% of everything that I was going through on my Instagram feed was marketing. It was something I didn't ask for. I didn't want to see that ad. You know, we watch shows and we see advertisements for things that maybe we don't necessarily know. But the, that issue is not just limited to social media, right? Because we see it all the time when we're watching TV, we're watching movies, you know. And every day I see pictures of the things, pictures and videos of things that I don't have and that I need. And what this has done in a lot of us, and I think you're probably guilty of it just as much as I am, is it's created a different level of discontent. I'm bombarded with what I don't have. And as a result... So many of us are walking through this life where we have all of this bombardment of, of these digital images and videos telling us what we don't have. We're discontent with our jobs. We're discontent with our financial stability. 
We're discontent with our marriages. We're discontent with our bodies. We're discontent with the toys that we own. We're discontent with our houses. We're discontent with our sex lives. We're discontent with the relationships that we have. We're discontent with our cars, our trailers, our clothes. Everything we have, we're constantly told that what we have and what, who we are is not enough. And that marketing is creating that discontent within us. So what is contentment and what is discontent? So content, I kind of adapted a simple uh, definition here. Content can be easily described as a state of peaceful happiness and satisfaction despite the wanting of more or better. Does that make sense? Right? It's a state of, of peaceful happiness and satisfaction despite all these other things around us. And I'm, I'm content with who I am. I'm content with what I have despite the fact that this exists out there. Now, if you were to flip that script, this is kind of maybe how I would define discontent. Is it would be a state of unease and dissatisfaction because of always wanting more or better. It's a state, of, it's not on screen, but it's a state of dissatisfaction or unease because of, because of the fact that I always want more or better. And so the question that we're going to open up with this morning in our time is what is your level of discontent these days? What are you discontent with? No, it's okay to be discontent. Like, I'm not saying that, that discontentment is bad across all levels, right? It's good sometimes to be discontent, yes or no? Right? If it wasn't for our discontentment with the way things are, we would never progress. We wouldn't be going to space. We wouldn't be, you know, developing new technologies. We wouldn't be, you know, like achieving great things in life. And I'm not saying that that all is bad. In fact, discontent can be very good. We've talked about that over and over again here at the church. Is some of us, when we get something from the Lord, we, feel like we call it this holy discontent. That if I don't do something about this, I'm going to be disobedient to God. Like he's created this holy discontent in us. Not all, not all discontent is bad, but with the things and who we are in this life, how discontent are you? See, for us as Christians... I believe Jesus teaches us that discontentment is a sign. Excuse me. Let me say that again. Contentment is a sign of spiritual maturity. Contentment is a sign of spiritual maturity. Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 6 when he's giving his sermon on the mount. Just listen to this. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body what you, or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. Do they not sow or reap or store away in barns? And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they are? And can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. So do not worry, saying, well, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself, for each day has enough trouble of its own." I believe Jesus makes an important correlation when it comes to discontent. And that connection is with trust. See, for Jesus, contentment is a sign of spiritual maturity. Why? Because contentment is tied to trust in God. The New Testament is pretty clear on what spiritual maturity is. We think we know what spiritual maturity is. We might think that maybe spiritual maturity is knowledge. Like, I know the Bible inside and out. And I went to Bible college or, you know, I, I, I know a lot. 
And we think that's spiritual maturity. Or we think that like, hey, I'm faithful to my church. You know, I give, I serve. You know, I'm here every Sunday. You know, I, I'm doing a lot for the Lord. That that's a sign of spiritual maturity. Or maybe there's some of us in here that think that maybe the use of our spiritual gifts is spiritual maturity. You know, like I, you know, I'm one of those really spiritually mature people because I can teach or I can lead worship or I can greet better than the other person next to me, you know, like, you know, that, that that's a sign of spiritual maturity. But the New Testament is actually very, very clear about what spiritual maturity is. It's trust in God. It's trust in God. The more we trust God in every aspect of our lives, the New Testament says, the more spiritually mature we actually are. So how content we are how content I am is actually a really accurate thermometer of my faith in God. Think about that. That my level of trust in God is the thermometer of my contentment. So how do we stay content in a digital world that really wants us to feel discontent with all that we have and all that we are? Because ultimately, like we said, our discontent is discontent with God. You know where this all started? So I was just kind of ruminating over this topic for weeks. I thought, you know, this is exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. If you go back and read the creation story as given account by Moses in the book of Genesis, you start off and you have, you know, uh, God creates everything, including Adam and Eve, and he creates them in the garden, and they are in complete 100% peace with God. They're at peace with one another. They're at peace with the things that they have given. They fully trust that God has given them all of their provision, that their position before God is perfectly set in place, and they know exactly what their purpose is. Their God, God had given them their purpose in this life. It was from God, and everything was fine. They had 100% trust in all of those things when it came to their relationship with the Lord. And then in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, watch what happens. Genesis chapter 3, it's all, it's all the way at the beginning of the book. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now just kind of read this through the lens of content and discontent. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild, other wild animals the Lord had made. He went to the woman and he said, Did God really say you must not eat from the tree of... Whoa, was that the Lord speaking right there? Um, <laughs> as soon as I said, did God really say, that happened. That was weird. Um, did God really say... You must not eat from any tree in the garden. So he's already raising these questions. Did God really say that? Even though the answer to that is yes. But he's like, did he really say that? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the tree, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he also ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So the serpent comes to Eve, in particular in the garden, and creates in her a level of dissatisfaction. You see it? That there is a piece of fruit hanging from an, that tree in the garden that will give you more than what God has given you. You want more? Go get it. You're not satisfied with who God made you to be? Go get it and you can be like him. 
you don't like the position that he's placed you in as subordinate to him, go and eat from that tree and you will be exactly what you want. And that external voice of dissatisfaction lured Eve and Adam to that fruit. Because I believe that discontent always, almost always comes not initially from inside of us. It comes from an outside voice that tells you that God's provision for your life is not enough. Your position in this world is not good enough. And your purpose in this world is not enough. There is something more out there that will fully satisfy you more than what God has already given you. Is that not indicative of what happens with us so often when we're being marketed to? Go get that and you'll be satisfied. Get the bigger boat, you'll be satisfied. Upgrade your phone and you'll be happy again, right? Find a new spouse and you will be happy. Work your way up the corporate ladder and you will be satisfied. Stop being content with who God has made you to be. Stop being content with what you have in this life. Stop being content with the position that you're in in this life and go get more. And that discontent is created within each one of us. And I believe that there is an element in the world in which we live in where this exact same technique is still working on God followers today. Paul speaks into this in 1 Timothy chapter 6. It will be the primary place where we spend the remainder of our time here this morning. Look what he says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 6. He says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we had food and clothing, we will be content with that. For those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith... And pierce themselves with many griefs. See, he says in the first, he says, godliness with contentment is of great gain. Godliness with contentment is of great gain. We think that something else out there is what is of great gain. The new boat, the new trailer, the new house, the new spouse, the new body, the new whatever. That that, that that is out there of something that is of great gain. And the Apostle Paul says, I have learned this truth, that godliness with contentment is of great gain. Not that. It's only what God gives you through godliness. That's where we find our contentment. And then he says in verse 7, he gives us that perspective that we all need at times. Is he says that we brought nothing into this world and we're going to take nothing with us. You came into this world naked, and you're going to be buried on the clothes on your back, and that's about all you're taking with you. You ain't taking that with you. I think there's an element where each one of us had this conversation with another pastor friend recently. We were talking about hedonism, and hedonism is this idea that we are constantly pursuing pleasure. We're constantly pursuing other things of self-indulgence. We have this sense, I think this prevailing thing of our sinful nature, even as Christians, where we all have this hedonism inside of us. And what hedonism actually is, it's a denial of the resurrection. And the reason why I say that is that if we as followers of Christ believe in the resurrection, what I mean by that is that this is not the end, right? That that, that the kingdom of God is what is in the end, right? Right? That by our, our resurrected bodies are going to inherit a kingdom, we're going to inherit the kingdom of God. And that hedonism is actually a denial of the resurrection. Because hedonism essentially says, if this is all there is, go get it. This is as good as it's going to get. So don't trust God with your marriage, even though it's difficult, or the sex isn't great. 
You can have something else, not trusting that this is God's best for you, but ultimately the kingdom of God is coming and the fulfillment of all that is good. That's what the ultimate end is, not this marriage or not this stuff. The, 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 the goal of this life is not just to eat, drink, and be merry. The hedonist says that I'm going to get the best of what this world has to offer because I truly believe deep down that this is the best that this world has to offer. Christian, is this the best that this world has to offer, yes or no? No, because we believe in the resurrection. We believe in the coming kingdom of God. And so Paul's like, guys, like you, have, you came into this world with nothing and you can take nothing with you. And then Paul says in verse 8, but if we have food or clothing, we will be content with that. And this is coming from a guy who had it all as a Pharisee, gave his life to Jesus, and lived a life of poverty and imprisonment the rest of his life. He had everything and he had nothing. And he says, if I have food and clothing, I'm going I'm to be content with that. John D. Rockefeller was asked while he was the richest man in the world, excuse me, at the time, was the richest man in America. He was asked the question, how much is enough? And he replied, we've heard this before, just a little more. How much is enough? Just a little more. And when John Rockefeller died, his net worth, adjusted for inflation, was somewhere in the realm of $336 billion dollars. By comparison, Jeff Bezos' net worth currently is a little over $200 billion, and Elon Musk is $190 billion. You know, I had heard of a pastor friend. I haven't had the guts to do this yet. I may try it at some point in my life. I don't know if I have the guts for it. Yeah. But he did a spending fast for an entire year. The only money he spent was on food and essential clothing. You know, this is like my underwear has holes in it, right? Like, <laughs> he did a spending fast for an entire year to see if he could remain content with what he had. He said it was one of the most, one of the strongest years of spiritual development for him as a Christian. Do it. All right, no. So the Apostle Paul goes on later in, in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. Uh, where's my... This will be familiar to many of you. He talks about contentment again. He says in Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10, he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Verse 11. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever, whatever the circumstances... I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. And he went, go into his background. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Paul says in here, I have learned the secret of being content. It's a secret. It's hard to find contentment. Amen? It's hard, it's hard to find that. But it's also something that we have to learn. Because it is difficult. It's something we must learn. Paul gives the secret here, and then we're going to talk about learning in just a moment, but he says in here that he has learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. He says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Some of us read Philippians 4.13, or we see it like on athletes, you know, shoes and uniforms, or Tebow always put it under his, you know, whatever, his eyebrows, eyebrows, under his eyes. We like to put it like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things. I can do all things. Let me let you in a little secret. No, you can't. You can't dig a hole to China right now. Okay? You can't. You can't. You can't do that. I don't care. You can't. Okay? You can't do all things. So G Paul is speaking in hyperbole right now. And he's, the context of this verse is all about contentment. 
Like when I'm feeling discontent in this life, I can do all things through him who strength, gives me strength. See, Paul knows that his strength of this life is not found in those things of this world. It is found in his relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is all sufficient to him. And he would say that if all that I had was Jesus, that's plenty. That's all that I need. And I can be content with that. But he also said, too, that he's learned how to be content. He says it's a secret, and I've learned that secret. And so here's a few maybe practical ways that you can learn how to be content. Number one is this, is I would encourage us to identify the voices that create discontent in our lives and call them out for what they are. When that ad comes on your Instagram or your Facebook feed or the ad comes on TV and they create that discontent in you like the serpent did to Eve, just go, I'm not buying what you're selling, man. I'm not buying what you're selling. You're trying to create a need in me that doesn't exist and I ain't buying it. So learn to identify those voices. Sometimes those voices are other people too, right? They're like legitimate people, right? We're going to talk about the comparison game next Sunday, but some of it comes from that. Secondly, is learn to surround yourself with content Christians. Learn to surround yourself with content Christians. There's something you think even, even with us that we fall into this trap of is we see what other Christians have and we want that. My encouragement would be to find Christians in your life that are content with what they have and model them and spend time with them. Not people that have the biggest and best thing and the next thing where you're like, man, I wish I could be more like so-and-so or I wish I had what she had or I wish I had what he had. Thirdly, way that we can learn how to be content in all circumstances is to learn gratitude and generosity. Learn gratitude and generosity. There's a lot of power in gratitude of learning to be thankful for what I already have. And the more, the less gratitude, excuse me, the less gratitude that we practice, I think the more discontent we feel. And so in your prayer life, it's interesting to examine this, is to, is to examine what you pray for. Are you always praying for something or someone else? Or are you giving thanks for what God has already given? But then on the other side of that, of gratitude, is also generosity. Gratitude should always produce generosity. Because when we realize how much we have in the excess that we do have, as, the, as Christ would do, it, push, it should push us. Sorry, I don't mean to should all over you right now. But it should push us towards generosity as well. To say, I'm going to give away my excess. Because that's what Jesus did. Generosity and gratitude. Fourth, is learn to memorize that Philippians 4.13 4, for what it is. That I can do all things through him who gives me strength. That when I'm feeling discontent in this life because there's something else out there that I think I need, I don't need it. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, is learn to find your purpose, provision, and position in life with the one you know not the one you want. Our contentment is found in the one that we know. It's found in Jesus Christ, not in that one thing that we still want. And we have to learn, all of us, myself included, man, is how, am I, how content am I if all that I had left was Jesus? If I, if I was only left with him, would he be enough? I think if we're really honest with ourselves, most of us would say we'd like to be there, but we're not there. There's still things of this world that we, we really love and enjoy, and it's not bad. But if everything was stripped away and all we had was Jesus, would he be enough? Because we know that the things of this world are going to fall away because they promise something that they just can't deliver on. But our God never fails. Our God never fails us. So when the feelings of discontent with our provision begin to well up inside of us, 
We look to him, not that, for our satisfaction. And when the feelings of discontent with, the, with our position in life, we find it in him. We find our position in him, not in the things of this world. And when our, we're feeling discontent with our purpose in life, we don't seek to find our purpose in the things of this world. We seek to find our purpose with him. God, what is my purpose in life? I want to do, I want to do what only you want me to do with my life. It's not there, it's with you. For you and I can do all things through him who gives us strength. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for who you are, but this morning we thank you for your provision. We thank you for the position that we have in this life, and we thank you for the purpose that you've given each one of us. Help us to live lives that are content with what we have and who we are and what you're making us to be, Lord. We desperately and deeply as people trying to honor you want to find ourselves in that place where we are fully content in you. And so help us in the coming weeks to identify those lies and those voices that are trying to sell us something that only you can deliver on. And make us a content people because we know that our level of contentment communicates our trust in you. And God, we declare to you this morning that we trust you with it all. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen.